whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lulu. Hello, Lulu. Uh, we are excited to, oh, actually this is the first regular episode back from your hip procedure and you're looking great and you're doing great. This is, uh, two days ago I took my first real shower where I like really like washed my hair, shaved my legs, did all the things. I was like, oh my God, I'm human. And today is the first time that I've done my hair and put on makeup in a week. And I'm like, okay, I'm still living only in sweatpants, which I am completely okay with. Uh, but yeah, I feel human again. You're doing good. You're doing good. Well, Lin- Lindsay has two uh, quick announcements, and then we're off into a bunch of stories. I got some big ones today. Oh, okay, great. Well, I have great stories as well. Well, well, well. Guess what time it is, friends, campers, <laughs> countrymen. <laughs> it is time for uh, Bad Magic, Wet Hot Bad Magic Summer Camp 2025 tickets to go on sale. Here is your forewarning announcements that the tickets will go on sale Saturday, March 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time for summer camp 2025. Our theme is the summer of love. Uh, tickets are, as always, first come, first serve. Get them while you can. You're going to go to badmagicproductions.com. Click the summer camp banner for all the info and the link to tickets. So you can go ahead and go there right now and get all the info you need to make your plans with your friends and family and fellow campers. Um, and we're just so excited to yeah. camp with y'all again. Yep, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> and then also just a quick reminder, don't forget that the Cummins Family Scholarship Fund is now open and accepting applications uh, by the time you hear this episode, which it opens on March 6th. So you, again, go to badmagicproductions.com, click the um, scholarship drop-down menu, and it will link you out, and off you go. Off you go. Off you go. All righty. All righty. That was great. Uh, how, how much fan-submitted true paranormal horror do you have today? I'll let you guess. Two. That is correct, Dan. Gold okay. star for you. Um, my first tale is a camping tale. And okay. I, I feel like I've been out in the woods recently in our tales, which I think is a sign that I'm ready to get outside into the warmer weather. But uh, what starts out as an innocent boys weekend turns into a lifelong fear of the woods. All right. So it's a fun tale. And then my second story uh, plays with the idea of wondering if our smaller interactions with the spirit world interconnected could an interaction that you have with spirits in one place then cause you to be more susceptible to them in another place. Oh, okay. All right. I I like, uh, I like those little teases. Okay. I'm Um, I'm working on them. (laughs) I have two. Uh, I love them both. The first is about a bunch of sporadic reports to police and media beginning in the early 1990s about people claiming to be social workers and attempting to abduct children from their parents, mainly in the UK and the U S police investigations into these reports failed to find any substantial evidence or locate any suspects. I know this topic might not seem paranormal, but it is so creepy and it'll make sense why I'm telling it as I share my story. Okay, good. Because immediately I was like, this is a terrifying tale, but how is this paranormal? Yeah, it, it, it'll it'll reveal itself. Okay. Uh, my second tale is set in small town America, posted by someone who has chosen to remain anonymous, and it revolves around a haunted laundromat. Have we had one of those yet? No, I don't think so. And I really like this story. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's really well put together. Um, Sounds silly, but it's creepy as shit. Uh, Very excited to share it. And then I don't think you're able to show off your spoopy socks today. I don't think you should do that. No, I have a system. I have one sock on and one sock off. Ah, that's okay. You know what you're talking about. Yes, yes. That's what I was asking. I'm like, there's a nursery rhyme or something about one Uh. sock on, one sock off, but none (laughs) of us can remember. But a big thanks to Justin and Dr. Spicy for these (laughs) awesome socks. Those are awesome. Yeah, they're really fun. Uh, Cat head situation. <laughs> so I have the left foot on. The right foot is sockless right now. Okay. I'm going to try and get down there and put it on. <laughs> well, while you do that, I am going to just start telling today's tale. Uh, here we go. Have you ever heard of the phantom social workers? In the early 1990s, reports emerged in the UK media, later in the US and elsewhere, concerning mysterious people knocking on families' doors and saying that they were working for social services or some adjacent uh, you know, uh, group of people helping kids. Uh-huh. Uh, most witnesses reported being visited by one or two women in their late 20s to early 30s 
who were dressed professionally. In some reports, the visits included a woman accompanied by a man who seemed to be acting in a supervisory role. The two figures would then inspect the household, speak to the children, sometimes in, uh, inspect the children, give them some sort of exam, and leave, never to appear again. When parents uh, inquired with actual social services, they were told that nobody by that description ever worked for them. The main theory regarding who these social workers truly were were future kidnappers, criminals causing uh, casing houses to find their next victims. Reports became so frequent that police in South Yorkshire launched a major investigation into the phantom social worker phenomenon in 1990 known as Operation Child Care. The investigation became one of the largest in UK history. With 23 separate police forces participating, it was massive. And roughly a year or after roughly a year of investigating, police had gathered 250 reports, but of those, police dismissed all but just 18. Criminologists would speculate that even those 18 cases may have involved self-appointed vigilante child abuse investigators or individuals seeking to make false accusations rather than actual child abuse uh, you know, professionals. Uh, no arrests were made and Operation Child Care was disbanded and many later labeled the entire thing a hoax. But was it? There was speculation that the social service agencies were so disorganized and kept such poor records that very real social workers were making legitimate house calls. But their bosses didn't know that because they weren't keeping track of their caseloads. However, some thought that these phantom social workers were not real social workers whose activity was not properly tracked, that they weren't criminals or self-appointed investigators either, but rather that they were something far stranger, something possibly from another realm. Time now for the tale of the phantom social workers. They came for Elizabeth Coupland's children in the winter of 1990. Peering out the window of her council flat in Sheffield, Yorkshire, she saw two young women, attractive and straight-backed as they rapped on her door. They were dressed officially, in dark blazers and skirts with pantyhose, and Elizabeth suddenly felt anxious. She was in her bathrobe still, and she had no time to change. When she opened the door, the young women explained that they worked for the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, which is the UK's leading children's charity that works in all sorts of ways to reduce child abuse. Elizabeth, mistaking them for actual government officials of some kind, felt she had no choice but to let them in. There was something commanding about their presence, the steadiness of their gazes as they held hers. Was it her imagination, or were they not blinking? They wanted to examine her children, both her two-year-old and five-month-old. Hesitantly, Elizabeth did lead them into her children's bedroom. Both of her kids were happy kids, as much as a baby and a toddler can be happy at least. What's more, they tended to love people, pretty much all people. They tried to interact with strangers out in public all the time. But this time, with these two, they fell silent, staring at the strangers with wide, apprehensive eyes. And when the women finally departed, it was like the air returned to the room. Elizabeth assumed she'd hear nothing more about the matter. Maybe it was a routine check. Or maybe one of her neighbors had called after hearing the toddler crying and mistaking it for something much more serious than a normal temper tantrum. But then, two days later, one of the women returned. This time, she was accompanied by a man. And when Elizabeth opened the door, they informed her that they had been instructed to now take her children. The fuck? Just like the time before, something seemed off with them. They were too still, too robotically polite, like their words were somehow scripted, and they didn't blink. Elizabeth did not invite them in this time around. Instead, scared, she immediately slammed the door, yelling that she was calling the police. After she watched them retreat with those same stiff, quizzical smiles, she did so, calling both the police and the NSPCC. The NSPCC denied that any of their workers or volunteers had ever paid a visit to anyone named Elizabeth Coupland. So who were the people that came to Elizabeth's home, and what did they want to do to her children? Terrifying. Soon, other eerily similar stories began cropping up. Two women would show up at a family's home asking to see their children. One of the women would later return with a man. Everybody said they were professional and polite, but the family still felt somehow threatened. In one instance, the children were actually removed from the home, but not kidnapped, or rather not for long. They were simply taken to a local park, given some ice cream, and then brought safely home. What? Both of those children were infants. Nobody knew why anyone would buy babies ice cream. As the reports kept coming in from anywhere from Bristol, Bath, Blackburn, Battersea, Barnsley, Edinburgh, Leicester, the police began to investigate, mounting Operation Child Care as I previously mentioned. And what did they find? Exactly nothing, outside of descriptions of some very strange people. All of the women were young, 
in their late 20s or early 30s, all smartly dressed. One witness, Catherine Millett, described her visitor as like a model. Her hair was tied back in a bun and she had a nice figure and wore a dark two-piece suit. Some of them seemed to be too perfect, like they were wearing wigs. They all had women and men, English accents, yet nobody could pinpoint exactly what region in England the accent came from. Interestingly, they never had local accents, as most social workers living and working in an area would. Soon, without anyone being able to pinpoint who these mysterious people were, no suspects, no leads, the investigation stopped. But the visits did not. They spread. Anne Wiley was another young mother who made a similar claim to that made by Elizabeth Coupland. A stranger wanted to examine her son, this time over 200 miles away in the Scottish town of Hamilton. It was in October of 1994 when the stranger, just one person this time, came to the back door of Anne's home under the pretense of needing to evaluate her toddler. What made this visit extra suspicious was that it was pouring down rain. Who would take a trip in the pouring rain at almost eight at night to evaluate a toddler, especially in a non-emergency situation without police escort? Soaking wet, the woman was also wearing a light blue coat, like the shade a nurse might wear. That seemed strange, too, as though someone had only heard of what a social worker was and attempted to dress the part based on never having actually seen a social worker. Anne would later say, I thought it was strange to start off with, as no one usually comes to my back door. This woman said that she was my new health visitor and she had come to check his medical rec- records. My son had been in the hospital. He was asthmatic. I said to her, do you have any identification? And she said, ooch, I, I must have left it in the car. Something my health, usual health visitor never does. I looked at the car and there was a gentleman in there smoking a cigarette, which again was strange as you wouldn't have thought health visitors would. So I asked her my son's name and she hesitated. But then she got out this file and I don't know if it was my son, but she seemed to know all his medical history, how long he'd been in the hospital for and so on. She was talking to my son, but it was pouring with uh, down rain and I said we'd all better go into the living room. I took my son inside and she went away. Ann Wiley described described this strange woman as being in her 20s of medium build and with dark hair. The thing about being drenched, soaking wet would reappear in many other instances, such as when Patrick and Catherine Leonard opened their door in Colne, Lancashire, uh, Lancashire, to uh, see a sopping wet woman who asked to come in. They shut the door in her face. These encounters may still be happening today. As recently as February 24, 2018, one of these strange figures may have attempted another abduction far from the UK. Right on the outskirts of Canberra, in Queen Bee in Australia, a mother had a strange encounter with two strangers, one man and one woman, both of which she had never seen before, hasn't seen since. They appeared all of a sudden, as though they'd materialized out of thin air. The mother, whose name was not released by the press, remembered that she usually heard someone coming up her street, since it was typically a quiet suburb, and it was quiet this day, but she didn't hear anything before the knocking. Knock, knock, knock. Through the window, the mother saw the man, approximately in his 30s, with a slim build, fair complexion, and dark hair. The woman appeared to be in her 20s, medium build, again with dark hair. They stated in those same slightly robotic voices that they were there to check on the welfare of the children, but the kids had just been put down for a nap. The mother expected the pair to say they'd come back later, but they didn't. Instead, the man uttered, We'll wait. The mother, not knowing what else to do, woke up her children and took them into the living room. After checking the children and also checking their bedroom, this pair left. Of course, authorities would have no record of any official visiting this home. What is all this? Just another urban legend or something more? Today, the children who are the subjects of these early visits are grown up. And some of them, if we can believe that several people posting on various forums really are them, have taken to the internet to give their versions of what happened on those fateful days. One posted without a name, is especially chilling. They came for me on December 2nd, 1998, but I'd seen them long before that. I was seven, soon to turn eight. My brother was only a couple of months old. He'd been born that summer. With the baby taking up all of my parents' attention, I spent the summer and most of that fall avoiding all the crying and bodily fluids associated with my baby brother by taking long walks around my neighborhood. It was October, just around twilight, when I saw them first. There was a playground, not too far away from my house where I was allowed to go, and that was where I went, at least at first. I started pushing it, little by little, one block further one day, another block further the next, until I was in a part of town I didn't really know too well. I knew it was time to get back and time for dinner and a bath, but I couldn't remember exactly how to. We lived in a safe little suburb, and I'd always been told that adults were trustworthy, 
so I readied myself to knock on somebody's door and ask. But when I finally chose a house that looked good, toys scattered in the front yard, bicycle on its side, leaning against the garage, I realized there were already two people walking up to the front door. They moved so quietly, I didn't really register them at first. Most adults I knew were, well, adults. They clopped along in heavy shoes and boots, needed to carry about a million bags everywhere, and were always rustling with something or trying to get out a coat or a sweater. Not these two women. Their backs were stiff, their eyes lifted up, as though they were about to talk to someone much taller than they were. Their eyes stayed lifted up as they knocked on the door with practiced precision. No, you heard right. One of them didn't knock on the door. Both of them did. At the same time. For some reason, I knew not to go near them. Instead, I hid behind a nearby bush watching. I had the same instinct feeling I had when I entered first grade at an elementary school where, all of a sudden, there were much bigger kids there than had been at pre-K and kindergarten the feeling that I needed to watch my back. A moment passed, and the women knocked again, in sync, like they were robots. A second later, the door opened, and I heard a woman explain that she had her hands full with feeding her twins dinner and would be with them in a moment. I expected the people to nod and smile the way adults did when they were trying to show that they didn't want to inconvenience you, but the women only inclined their heads slightly. They were still looking up. The woman inside the house suddenly looked scared as she continued to face the two women outside her door. I'm still not sure what they did to frighten her, but the front door shut with force and the women backed away. It was only then that I realized how close they'd been to the door. As one of the women backed away, she lost her footing on the steps and the other woman reached out to steady her. The first woman's hand shot up and latched onto the second woman's shoulder and messed up her hair. No, not messed up her hair, I realized. She knocked her hair partially off. I only caught a glimpse of it, but underneath the wig looked like some sort of light fuzz, like her hair had been hacked off with a dull razor. A moment later, the door opened again, this time the husband standing in the doorway looking angry and the woman and the women were standing exactly as they had before. At that point, I beat a hasty retreat. I knew I had to get home and along the way managed to convince myself that I'd only seen something I wasn't old enough to understand yet. Some part of the adult world that escaped my childlike explanations. I also thought I felt their eyes on me as I left, but I convinced myself that I was imagining that too. Until they came for me on December 2nd, 1998. I was in the bath when the doorbell rang. It had been a muddy day, raining incessantly for going on a week, and since I decided to play soccer outside with friends, I'd come home a veritable mud ball. Even though my little brother was so much younger than me, we still took baths together. Because my parents' bathtub was huge, and because he seemed to calm down when it was me and him, as opposed to him being alone. I heard the doorbell ring, my father opened the door, and the drops of water on my back turned to ice-cold needles. Can I help you? We're from Child Services. We'd like to talk to your sons. What is this about? Does someone make a report? Everything will get explained shortly. Can you get the children now? I knew instantly that it was them. There was something about them referring to us as children, not kids or boys. Not the way every adult I'd ever known had referred to me and my brother. Not the kid and the baby. Children. That clipped clinical word. Get dried up and put your clothes on, my mom said, coming into the bathroom. There's someone here to see the both of you. I could see the worry on her face and felt it clenched in my own stomach. But I did as I was told. Maybe I thought it was good. If I was extra good, the women would leave. Maybe I thought if I was good, if I was extra good, the women would leave. When I got to my bedroom where they were waiting, I gasped. It wasn't the women. It was a woman and a man. But, and I still can't explain it, the man had the same face as the other woman from before, like they could have been twins. He had the same immaculate hair, the same placid expression. I was sure that if I pulled on his hair... It would come off. But what would happen then? Thank you, the woman said in the monotone, in her monotone voice to my mother. Law requires us to speak to the children alone, to make sure they aren't coerced. I'm sure you understand. I was now internally screaming for my mother not to leave us alone with these people. But I knew that there was likely little any of us could do to stop them doing whatever they wanted now. They were already in the house. We were at their mercy. Uh, uh, all right, my mother said. I'll just wait out in the hall then. I had no idea what this inspection would entail. I was terrified that they would touch me, but instead the man crouched next to me, the woman next to my brother, propped up his baby seat, and they just stared at us. You're Matthew, right? The man said. Almost eight years old. Happy early birthday, Matthew. I just stared at the ground, silently waiting for it to be over. We're here to help you, the woman said to my baby brother. We have your best interests at heart. When I now looked up, I saw that neither of them were looking directly at us. Their gazes were blank, hovering somewhere above our heads. And slowly, without looking directly at him, but somehow knowing exactly where he was, the woman reached out her hand for my brother. No! 
I, s I said loudly, reaching out and intending to knock her hand aside. But my body responded involuntarily to what I'd been thinking earlier, and my fingers extended further, reaching for the wig and finding it, which popped off with a swishing sound and flopped to the ground like a dead animal. The woman turned to me and didn't appear angry. She had an empty grin on her face, her shorn head glinting under the lights. She made no attempt to put her wig back on at that moment. Is that what you wanted to see, Matthew? She touched my arm and her finger was ice cold. It's all right. Soon you'll know everything. I'm not exactly sure what happened next. All I know is that I was yelling, yelling loudly, and my mom, who I was sure was waiting right outside, burst into the room. My dad followed her. My brother began to cry. My dad said something about the police, and in a flash, the strange impostors were both standing, the woman's wig somehow fully back on, as though it had never been taken off. My dad told me to leave the room and go to the back of the house with my brother and I did, bundling him up in my arms and running. When my parents finally came and got me, they said that the people had gone, departing politely as though nothing was wrong. The police were called, I'm sure, uh, and as you were probably thinking, they had no record of any visit like that that was supposed to take place. My parents gave the police descriptions, or tried to, but couldn't remember a lot of important details, such as eye color, height, weight. I couldn't remember those details either. I still can't. I remember pulling off a wig. I think it was dark, but I don't remember exactly how long the hair was or exactly what color. It's like someone partially wiped out our memories. No one could recall what their vehicle looked like or if they'd even gotten into a vehicle. They left the house, our parents checked on us, and when they quickly returned to see where they had gone, they were just vanished. After reading a lot of this stuff online, I've come to the conclusion that they were probably there to take my brother. Something about newborns and infants seems to appeal to them the most. Maybe their inability to protest? Almost 30 years later, I can say I've never seen them again. There was a rash of those incidents in my suburban community in 1998, then a similar one a few hundred miles away in 1999, in a different county the year after that. They seemed to always be on the move. I've moved far away from the town in the years since, uh, from that town, and my baby brother is now an adult man who doesn't remember a thing about any of it. But when he had his first child last year, I told him and his wife, don't open the door for anybody who says they need to inspect your children without first talking to the police, because you might never see your children again. I haven't read any reports of these people keeping any kids, but it doesn't make sense that eventually they won't. Maybe these reports keep popping up because they're just looking for the right child. And when they find that child... Where will they take them? And what will they do? This is so creepy. Yeah, and there is a lot of articles. Like, you can find, like, old archived articles. It's, it was a, especially in the 90s. But I'm like, what a strange thing. Did it only happen in the UK? Excuse me. Uh, no, the UK, US, Australia, and then I think um, lesser, you know, lesser times in other countries. What mostly in Europe. Okay, first of all, what is, like, so bizarre to me, and maybe yeah. just because I had the privilege of growing up in a safe household. Yeah. Although it doesn't sound like any of these kids were being abused or were like, no. but it's like, I didn't. Okay. Obviously I know that CPS, like our version of that can just show up at any time because if you know, if, if you see something, yeah. you know, whatever, and you call the neighbors. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 But like, just as a rule of thumb, I don't know anybody who's been like, Oh yeah. Just these like random people showed up one day uh -uh. for like a, a, health and wellness check or whatever like it's so it's so foreign to me that that's yeah i mean when i i mean it's been a lifetime ago but like when i worked at cps briefly yeah it's like there would be unannounced visits you know like um right but weren't you probably but, already like on their radar uh like would you be as i recall yeah yes the people that we visited were not people that there'd never been a complaint to right it, it, it was kind of I, I hate to say the term like regulars but they were on the radar. So like, I don't remember, I don't remember showing up anywhere uh -huh. and having the people who live there just being like, what, what's going on? Exactly. Exactly. I yeah, don't remember confusion. That's what I was thinking is it's like, you know, unfortunately in yeah. oftentimes when CPS is showing up, you know, it is someone yeah. who is dealing with a lot of different things. And yeah. so, you know, they're, they're not surprised. Yeah. If, if when our kids were little, somebody just showed up at our house, I'd be like, excuse you. The right. fuck are you doing here? Right. Like I would be so confused. Oh, I'd be like, if, if they wanted to inspect the kid, like when the kids were little, I'd be like, get the fuck out of here. That actually yeah. happened to us once where a van pulled Whoa. up in our neighborhood and they were going around to houses and they actually came up to our house. And Whoa. the first question they asked is, Hey, we were just curious, do you have any kids in the neighborhood? What? what? Yeah, we were like I slammed the door in their face. I immediately called the cops. What did they find? Like, what was the We never knew. Wait, I took pictures of them and then I sent them to the cops and they're like, Well, we can't do anything about that. Just right. Not, it's not know, illegal to yeah, ask. Yeah. But I took the I took video of them like taking pictures of my house, to other uh, people's houses. It was terrifying. Yeah, this was when we um Oliver was like one. Yeah. 
Did they look now? Do they fit the description of these people? Yeah, what do they That's look a like? Good question. I, I honestly don't yeah. remember. I'm gonna need. Ah, I'm weird. gonna need you to do some digging into but I your do remember phone. It was a van, and it was two people. They got out, and one of them had a notepad. One of them had a camera, and then you could tell there were other people in the car in the van. Oh my weird. god! I to, this is. I, I was thinking about this the whole time because yeah, that was one of the more terrifying, like unanswered things in my life. God. Okay, well, we're gonna need a report back, Logan. Uh, yeah, I'll <laughs> you're gonna have Kate to after work. Yeah, and just see like if you still have like the video. Like, and My now God. I'm curious. I'm like, if those, if what you captured matches this tale, man. Oh my now, god! Now, not that I would do this, not that I'm that tough, because I'm not. But my fantasy brain immediately went to that happens, and how great would it be if you could get away with this? You're like, oh yeah, no, no, we do. Come on in, and then they come in the house, and then just beat the living shit out of both of them, like well, savagely beat them. Okay, well, yes, if uh-huh. their intentions were nefarious. Now, in this story, yeah, it just feels like I, I was making so many notes of like. Initially, I was like, "Are there black-eyed adults?" Like, I that, know, I know, that's crossed my mind too. I started there, yeah, but there was no, but n- no one can remember like their eye color, their hair color. There's a lot of reports of dark hair, but, but maybe they needed to be invited in because that because there could be a thing of like, hey, can I come in your house? Uh-huh. And then the people are like, sure. Then they've technically been invited in. I know. Can be part of that same lore. So I was thinking that. Yeah. Then I was like, are they aliens of sorts that uh-huh, are like? That's what I thought too. Doing a lot of mimicking. Are they aliens that built human robots? So they're so the <laughs> like, yeah, like yeah. animatronic. Uh, <laughs> and then also I was like, are these like the Men in Black? Because right. like, there's all this memory loss about like you know weirdly we couldn't remember what kind of car they came in. We couldn't remember hair color, eye color, what they said, what they looked like, their height, their weight, their build. Like this yeah. is so creepy. Yeah, it, I, I do have I do have a picture here. Um, uh, th- this is some some people who thought that they uh, could kind of remember what they look like. What a weird these this, faces! This is not what I was envisioning. No, and these faces, it's like I mean, it's yeah, just like a, a composite or whatever kind of rendering. So that could be why, but it's like they don't look realistic <laughs> like at all. I feel like the woman on the right, yeah, uh, glasses almost, or no glasses, almost looks like glasses. Okay, looks like Linda from Bob's Burgers. Oh, funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I that, was like, they both kind of look like they could be part of the Beatles. This comes from a BBC article in uh, 2002. Face on the left, rendering of a woman posing as a nurse. Face on the right, rendering of a woman posing as a social worker. These two showed up at a mother's home in South Oxfordshire, October 1st, 2002, asking to examine her two-year-old son. They're so creepy. It's like yep. Uncanny Valley kind of vibes. Yeah, she let him in. They did examine her son, uh, supposedly for signs of sexual abuse. Then they met with another man outside in a blue Ford hatchback of some sort, who was also supposedly a social worker, and then they just vanished. No one ever found out who they are, what they what they were really up to, but they were definitely not social workers or a nurse sent to that home. This is so disturbing on so many levels. I know. What a cr- I had no idea this phenomena had ever existed. This is, and then the, like the things of like um, always in pairs. Yeah. So that that also there was one report of a singular person showing up. I think. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh huh. But like. M- Almost always in pairs. Yeah. So that lends itself to black eyed children, adults. Right, right, I don't know. Yeah. Um, they're like uniforms that they were all like smartly dressed. Yeah. Two piece suits, all like uh-huh. slim stature, which then like, okay, that leads me more into like yeah. the alien realm of like narrow shoulders, narrow waist, right. like same face. Because when we see aliens, it, as we think of aliens, like the grays yeah. or whatever, it's like they're all, they all look the same, more yeah. or less. Uh, yeah. Okay. What about the looking up thing? The, the fa- yeah, like, that was a weird detail in that last story that uh, that anonymous posting. Yeah, the, the looking kind of off. Yeah. What did did that signal anything for you? No, did, I don't. I just thought it was weird. It made me think that they were like looking for permission or like yes, proceed or like oh, like, 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 like a, some other entity like they're communicating with. Yeah, mm-hmm. like a, a boss, if you will. Right. Right. Yeah. Very very creepy. I will say, like you know, any parents listening or people who will be parents, it's like. Yeah, if somebody shows up unannounced like that, you don't have to let them do shit. It's like... Yeah, and, and especially maybe, when they don't have any sort of identification you know of what? who they are or where they're from. And even if they do, even if they do, I would yes. say it's like, if it's completely unannounced, be like, you know what? Come back with the police. Yeah, or because, just, you, you yeah. can just tell them to stay outside. You can close the door and just be like, hang on a second. And you uh-huh. can call the cops and say, hey, T- totally. there's somebody here yep. and this feels very sketchy. Yep. Can can you send somebody? Yeah, but you don't have you just you don't have to just let some social worker into your house. You don't have to let anyone into your house unless it's the police with a warrant. Correct, with right. a warrant. With a warrant is the key, right? There. And it's like, yeah, the police don't even get to just come on into your house. It is such a. Um, I think like all of us, you know, I was thinking about like uh, Monroe recently got pulled mm-hmm. over, mm-hmm. and like how um, 
it's so terrifying to have an encounter, even yeah. when you've, okay, she was, she was speeding on the freeway. Like, but like, I don't want to say you haven't done anything wrong. Yes, she was wrong, but like, she didn't do anything terrible, yeah. right? You know, she hadn't harmed anyone or herself or what have you. But there is something about like, when you are, at least for me, even when I see a police officer, like in the grocery store at Starbucks, I'm immediately like a little bit on edge. <laughs> like, yes, sir. No, sir. Yeah. Like, I just get a little like, so I understand this concept mm -hmm. that if if the cop showed up in my house or what appeared to be a cop, yeah, I think just inherently I would be like, well, I'm trained to trust you and I'm trained to believe that you are here for good. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I sh and I should succumb to your power and your authority. Like, mm -hmm. but, but you know, it's hard to imagine that in this situation and, yeah. and then think about being like, oh no, you can't come in. Right. Like how, right. Do, like, how do you like resist that? So it's, you know, I don't know. It's definitely a thing to like take I know into it, consideration and have in your mind of like, yeah. you know, if you get pulled over, obviously turn your car off, put your hands on the steering right. wheel. Don't be a fucking asshole. Uh, but like if someone shows up at your home when they're coming to you and you know, you haven't done anything wrong. Yeah. 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 That, that's a, they, they, they've done psychological studies on that. Like Stanley Milgram's, uh, prison experiment, as far as like, you know, obedience experiments, uh, people to, you know, define to authority yeah. or deferring to authority, just listening kind of like, regardless of what they say. I actually did, uh, an experiment like so many years ago now. I don't know if I've talked about it on scared to death. I was pitching a show in LA, like year one, I was down there. Okay. And one of many shows I pitched, but it was a hidden camera show. And uh, it was supposed to be like psychological experiments, like reenacting classic psychological experiments or coming up with new ones and testing them in the wild. Mm -hmm. And for our little like pilot, just me and this uh, dude with a camera, we went, to, I dressed up like a security guard, but looked kind of like a, a little off. Like, uh, as you do. Uh huh. Uh huh. But I had like, I think I had a wig. Or something, but it, it didn't look, I didn't look legit in my uh -huh, mind. It was uh -huh. a little cartoonish, which was, you know, for the comedic effect, just to see if that would still work. And I had a little clipboard, but I had like a, on my belt, I had like a big flashlight, like a mag flashlight. Looking yeah, like, Paul Bart. Mm -hmm, Paul mm -hmm, Blart. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, I got it. I had all the little things to make myself s somehow look like I was legit. Had a little fake badge. And, uh, and I just walked around parks in Santa Monica and would just approach people and tell them that they were in violation of some citation mm -hmm. and would have to leave. Like one guy was on his bike. And I was like, sir, 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 sir. Stopped him. I was like, you need to get off your bike. And he just did. And I was like, uh, there's a citate, there's a uh, whatever. Ordinance. Ordinance. There we go. I was saying ordinance a lot. Ordinance 416, um, you know, between the hours of like noon and 8 p.m., no bikes in the park. Sorry, we don't have the signs up yet. And I would just do random shit like that. Almost every, I think every person but one listened to me. Interesting. Uh, and weird stuff. Like I'd be like, somebody be reading a book. And I'm like, sorry, sir, this is a no reading zone. And I'm like, you have to read on that side of the sidewalk between the hours of just whatever, just random bullshit. But I would present it real authoritatively. One lady, it was so funny. I was trying to like say that people had to walk in pairs and across <laughs> some nonsense. <laughs> and I was like, ma'am, stop, stop. And she was on the phone and she, and, I, and she flipped me off. She's like, she's like, fuck off. And just like kept walking. That's much more LA. <laughs> They're used to the crazy. But it did, it did. It's a, like a scary illustration of yeah. a lot of people are just mm -hmm. like, oh, Here's someone that's an authority figure mm -hmm. presenting themselves as one. Uh -huh. They're telling me to do this. I've been conditioned my whole life yeah. to just listen and follow those instructions. And so that's what I do. Uh, yeah. 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 Huh. But yeah, you have, you have a lot of rights in most places to not have to listen to people in a lot of situations. It's a bummer that show didn't get picked up. I feel like I oh, would have enjoyed that. It would have been so fun. Yeah. Well, yeah. carry on. What do you do? What do you do? There you go. Any producers listening, there's another show for you. <laughs> I don't know if I'm interested in that one anymore. Yes. Yeah, oh. you, you can have it. We can uh, sell it. <laughs> right, you can tell right. The rights. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I was. Uh, I really found that story just fascinating. That it's fascinating, it's bizarre, happening. creepy, and mm -hmm. I. Do, I definitely believe that there's a paranormal element to that. Right. Whether it's aliens, I do think of Men in Black in that paranormal space. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was black-eyed adults. Right, and they're examining. I mean, they did examine a lot of kids. So are they just like, um, instead of like beaming people up in their spaceship? Yeah, they're like, oh, we could just do it right just, in front of them. We just walk into their house. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, definitely for me, it seemed like it was uh, a potential men in black. Like, but, but like they had specific duties to like, you are on the kids. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, this over here, this uh, department's up on abductions, you know, all that stuff. So it's like a very specific role. Yeah, yeah. totally. Okay, I, I, I like that one. I like this next one too. Are you ready to check out a haunted laundromat? Oh, yeah. No setup for this next tale. We're just going to get right into it. Go, go, go. Time now for the tale of Thank You for Visiting. Sometimes it seems to me that just about every scary story I've ever heard starts the same way. I mean, we're all familiar with some version or another of 
Once upon a time in a tiny one streetlight town with a dismal population of a few meth heads, some old timers who refuse to move anywhere else, a bunch of folks who desperately want to move anywhere else but can't afford to, and a surplus of creeps who insist on calling all women sweetheart and darling, there also resides an evil not of this world that wreaks havoc on the living. Well, don't be disappointed. But my story starts essentially the exact same way. You see, I live in a small town in the middle of buttfuck nowhere. And as you probably saw coming, I am convinced that along with me and my family and the other townies that litter our minuscule settlement, something lives here that none of us understand, that none of us could ever understand. Now you'll probably think by virtue of the cliche beginning to my story, the whole thing is bullshit. And honestly, you're more than welcome to think that. It's not my job to make you believe me or to make you feel the things I've felt or see the things I've seen. But before you write me off as another Stephen King wannabe attention whore on the internet, spewing a half-baked, watered-down, unoriginal, scary story that's been told a million times before, I want you to consider something. Yes, there are a zillion allegedly true ghost stories that all happen to take place in the small towns in middle-of-nowhere America. But have you ever thought that maybe there's a good reason for that? Have you ever thought that maybe so many of these tales take place in small towns, not only because it's a cliche setting for horror, but because... That's where this stuff actually happens. That maybe there's something about the infinite cornfields, the back roads that lead to dark places only God and horny teenagers would ever go. (laughs) (laughs) Main streets lined with abandoned restaurants, faded billboards that scream, Are you ready to burn in the fiery pits of hell? Call this number to be saved. Cemeteries around most corners and churches around even more. Community bullet boards, community bulletin boards that haven't been updated since Reagan was in office dilapidated barns housing God knows what, and remote houses that are home to God knows who. Maybe there's something about all that mess, all that empty space and monotony that makes a perfect breeding ground for evil things unseen. Anyway, think what you like. This is what happened to me. In my town, there are a plethora of creepy establishments that at first glance, you might automatically assume to be haunted. Places like the abandoned gas station off the side of the highway, or the old farmhouse with boarded up windows that sits equally abandoned next to it, the schoolhouse from 1901 that was recently converted into condos with patched up bullet holes in the door, or the cemetery with more graves for children than for adults, the colonial house with dolls stacked high in each of its windows, or the dilapidated mortuary on Main Street between the fire station and the laundromat. However, as far as I know, and I'll be the first to admit that I'm no expert, None of these places are plagued by evil spirits. They've just been made creepy by the endless scourge of time and the human creepiness that's rubbed off on them or by some asshole putting a bunch of old dolls in the windows. No, the malignant spirit in my town is not residing in any of the obvious places. Instead, it's hiding in plain sight. It's disguised itself within the tedious, the mundane. And you might disagree, but I think its decision to haunt someplace unassuming, if indeed it has any choice at all shows that not only is this thing evil, but it's intelligent. About a year ago, I ended up in a conversation with a woman at the local park about how I had just moved to town to be with my boyfriend. She was an older lady and clearly just wanted someone to chat with, and I was procrastinating, un- uh, un- procrastinating unpacking, and therefore more than happy to oblige. At one point, she asked me if I had a washer and dryer unit in my building. I told her I didn't, and asked her where the nearest laundromat was, hoping to God she wouldn't say the next town over. Instead, her face just darkened. Oh, well, there's one in town, just right up the road here, but I just I just wouldn't go there without your fella tagging along, okay? I nodded and was about to ask her more when she got a call from her grandkid. Sorry, dear, I gotta take this. It was lovely to meet you. With that, she got up and continued her walk around the park, talking loudly to her grandkid about his recent piano recital. Honestly, I didn't think much of what she said at the time, I figured she meant the laundromat was a sketchy place where I should watch out for randos and pervs who might try to steal my underwear or something worse. About a week later, I had mostly unpacked and hung enough paintings and scattered enough decor around the apartment to sufficiently girlify the place. My boyfriend isn't big into interior design, unless it has to do with his Batman wall, which is decorated, as the name suggests, with various Batman paraphernalia. I was getting used to my new neighborhood and was continuously finding hidden pockets of beauty in the most unexpected places. Places like the grocery store parking lot at Sunset and the library inside City Hall. I was starting to feel at home. And since I work remotely and my boyfriend works insane hours as a nurse, I'm talking 12-hour shifts four days a week, sometimes five, I had ample time to explore the town. Eventually, the fateful day came upon me, as it does for us all, the dreaded laundry day. 
I loathe the chore of washing and folding clothes, but because I had some time on my hands, I thought it would be a nice gesture for me to take on the burden of the sweaty pile of clothes overflowing in the bin. I gathered up all the rogue socks and t-shirts strewn about the apartment, stripped the bed of its dirty sheets, and for good measure grabbed the bath mat from the bathroom, which, upon taking a delicate whiff, I realized smelled overwhelmingly of stinky feet. I loaded it all up into my Honda, along with a container of laundry soap pods and dryer sheets, and headed towards the laundromat. I didn't bother pulling up Google Maps. I had passed the place enough times while walking down one of only two commercial one of the only two commercial streets in town to be confident in my navigation. However, if someone hadn't pointed it out to me previously, I probably would have missed it. The laundromat is nestled in the same red brick building as a mortuary called McAllister Funeral Home, as I believe I mentioned earlier. The dead house undoubtedly overshadows its neighbor, with its oversized concrete pots flanking each side of the door, containing an explicable array of pastel plastic flowers, its decaying old world blade sign hanging sinisterly above the entryway, its stark white door with a stained glass portrayal of Jesus' crucifixion, and last but not least, its welcome mat with a cheery depiction of a dog that jovially reads, Wipe your dirty paws. The overall impression of the mortuary's facade, at least to me, is that they are inviting passerbys to come on in and watch the corpses of their loved ones get played with like dolls. Affixed to the brick wall, adjacent to Jesus bleeding out in glossy red and pink and blue stained glass, is another sign that outlines the funeral home services in curly cursive letters. It boasts that they offer bathing, dressing, refrigeration, embalming, on-site cremation, viewings, gatherings, and catering. <laughs> Next to the striking exterior of McAllister's funeral home, it's easy to miss the subdued laundromat next door, identifiable only by its small, faded yellow and black sign that reads, Coin-Operated Laundry Center, an laminated sheet of paper with the words, Cold Water, a dollar, inside, flimsily attached to the door with packaging tape. The laundromat borders an alley that leads to a shared parking lot for it in the mortuary. It was empty when I pulled up, so I backed into the spot closest to my laundromat's rear door and hopped out of my car. The sun was beginning to set, but the air was still hot and thick with humidity. I felt sweat pool on my upper lip and briskly wiped it away. As I began unloading the bags of dirty clothes to be taken inside, I was quick quickly struck by two things. The first was the silence. I felt consumed by it. Even though my town is often described as quiet, it's really anything but, especially in the summer. Everywhere you go, you hear the clicking and buzzing of fat insects, the hum of lawnmowers and the screeches and songs of birds. You hear motorcyclists hurtling down the nearby highway or the long-haul truckers honking at each other and other drivers. You hear dogs barking, kids playing, and from some of the traditional non-mortuary houses of God, a chorus of church bells at regular intervals throughout the day. In my town, you're constantly enraptured by little sounds. They're inescapable, but there in that empty parking lot, there was nothing. No murmurs, or squaws, or chirps, or piercing chimes, or blaring horns, no wind in the trees. I couldn't even hear the cars nearby on Main Street. I felt disoriented and irked, and was about to investigate the lack of noise further, though to this day I'm not sure how I would have done that, when I was distracted by the second thing that struck me behind the laundromat. A quarter. It was sitting neatly on top of our gray sheets in my collapsible laundry basket. I was perplexed. I know it doesn't sound very strange to find change at the laundry, but this was bizarre. I could have sworn that just a moment before it hadn't been there, and even if it had, in the position it was in, precariously balancing on a fold in the linen, it would have absolutely fallen out by now with all the tossing around I was doing. I was overwhelmed with the feeling that someone, something, had put it there, and I knelt down to inspect the mysterious coin. It was old, its face eroded and dirty, and upon further inspection I realized it was wet. A thick dollop of dark red liquid made a tiny pool on its surface and was leaking over its serrated edges and onto the sheets. Blood. Without thinking, I plucked the quarter up and threw it across the parking lot. Probably the only time in history that anyone has ever thrown away a perfectly good quarter just outside of a coin-operated laundromat. I left behind a damp, dark reddish stain where it had been resting. In that moment, I wasn't scared. Not yet. I was just perplexed. I gathered my things and hurried inside, trying to convince myself of some nonsensical explanation, like it had to have been old period blood on the sheets, or that I must have had a cut somewhere and was dripping onto the laundry. Once inside, I was thankfully met by sound. There was a rhythmic thumping coming from a dryer on the other side of the long room, and a consistent low drone coming from the fluorescent lights. At first, I was grateful to have been relieved of the strange quiet that engulfed me outside, 
But the longer I stood there, inspecting the laundromat and listening to its voice, the more I felt like I was being greeted by something more unnatural than silence in summer. The interior of the laundromat was a skinny rectangular shape that extended infinitely in front of me, or at least that's what it felt like. Its hallway-like appearance and low ceilings created a sort of optical illusion. I was convinced that even if I walked forever and ever and ever towards the door on the other side, I would still never make it there. I also felt like I had just walked into someone's house and they didn't want me there. Two of the gray walls were lined with dull beige appliances that couldn't be newer than the 70s. And scattered about the middle area, there were bright red folding tables and metal carts for patrons to carry their dirty clothes to and fro. I thought of that bloody quarter when I remembered that I foolishly didn't bring any quarters to pay for the laundry. Pushing the growing disquiet inside of me inside, I turned to the change machine on my left and fished in my wallet for a dollar bill or a five or a ten to feed into its hungry mouth. Nothing. Damn. I sighed and looked to the other side of the room where the ATM machine stood forbiddingly. I started making my way to it, reminding myself that it was just a laundromat and that I was a big girl who wasn't afraid of mysterious bumps and thumps and pieces of loose change. The matte gray ATM was, like the rest of the place, ancient. Next to it stood a pathetic vending machine that only sold canned sodas. And next to that was one of those infuriating arcade claw games, piled high with a heap of lifeless teddy bears and cartoon characters that may never be freed from their glass prison. I stuck my debit card into the ATM, and I thought of my boyfriend and I's first date, when he must have spent $30 trying to get me one of those damn things. He never did manage to grab anything. I was still lost in thought when the old machine spat out a couple $10 bills. Bang, 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 bang! As I reached for my money, my heart leapt out of my chest and I stumbled backwards against one of the folding tables, not knowing where the sound came from. I looked frantically around trying to find the source when I noticed something dribbling out of the mouth of the vending machine. Nervously, I walked over and flipped open the little plastic flap at the bottom of the big clunky thing. Inside, I found a mound of popped open cans of soda, spraying and leaking their sticky insides onto each other. I let the flap shut and backed away. My heart was racing. The skin on my face had felt numb. I felt paralyzed. I couldn't stop staring at the vending machine, horrified by it, scared of what would fall from its bowels next. I realized that what happened could have been nothing more than a machine malfunctioning, but that was not at all what it felt like. And then a moment later, the little black screen just above where you make your payment flushed the follow flashed the following words, one by one, before going blank. Thank you for visiting. As soon as the message was finished, from a couple of old speakers on the walls that must have been hooked up to a radio at one time, a distorted, automated voice spoke. Thank you for visiting. I spun around, wondering what the fuck was happening, trying to steady my breathing and telling myself there was no way I was going to have a panic attack at the laundromat. Then abruptly, the claw game sputtered to life. The metal claw twitched, opening and closing a few times before jolting around in quick, harsh movements. Forwards, then backwards, then to the side, then backwards again to the side, to the other side, forwards, and over and over and over again, faster and faster and faster until suddenly it stopped and began slowly lowering itself, clamping open and closing and cl opening and closing like the blood-hungry mouth of a predator. It clamped down on something behind the pile of smiling, glittery-eyed bunny rabbits and teddy bears and began languidly lifting it up. I covered my mouth to stifle the scream. It looked exactly like one of my shirts, the one I'd been wearing the day before, but covered in blood. I started to scream, and again, the voice from the speakers loudly proclaimed in an increasingly contorted and sickening tone, Thank you for visiting! Thank you for visiting! Thank you for visiting! Thank you for visiting! Seconds later, the demonic voice was joined by the thunderous cacophony of every door on every washer and every dryer slamming violently open and shut, over and over again. Slam! 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 I stumbled to my feet and started sprinting towards the exit, desperately trying to avoid getting stuck by the terrorizing, suddenly animated machines. Without stopping, I grabbed my bags and threw myself against the door, stumbling and nearly tripping and taking a nosedive onto the pavement outside. I haphazardly shoved my things into the car, climbed into the driver's seat. I felt bile in my throat and a fear unlike anything I'd ever felt seeping into my skin and bones. I yanked the car into drive and sped into the alley, then out onto Main Street. I kept driving until I hit the highway and followed it all the way to the hospital where my boyfriend works. Once parked in the visitor lot of the hospital, I texted him that I got a little freaked out at the laundromat and was going to wait there until his shift ended in a couple of hours. I even added a little LOL emoji, even though I was definitely not laughing. I know it was a stupid thing to say, but I didn't know how else to explain what had just happened over text in a way that wouldn't lead to him really worrying about me. I just wanted him to know where I was. Taking deep breaths, I set my phone in my lap and tried my best to regain my composure. My heartbeat had almost reached a normal rate, when something caught my eye in the cup holder of the center console. There, directly in the middle, sat a single, 
dirty quarter, coated in a drop of blood. I knew that's what she was going to say. <sighs> oh my God. It's nice and creepy ending to that. That one. is so weird. Mm-hmm. I have like such a romantic ver- like vision of laundromats in my brain. I think yeah. just from like rom-coms and movies over the years where it's like, you know, oh, is this machine open? You know, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't happen like that. Laundromats are 0% romantic. <laughs> uh, I've only been to a few. Like, I don't know, growing up, yeah, we would go to laundromats to wash like comforters or like big, mm-hmm. like our curtains and stuff. Cause you and I would go to it some, that one down the street sometimes, right? Uh, when the one in the apartment building wasn't working. I went there by myself for sure. Different times in uh, sal- the Saltaire apartment. Yeah. I cannot place myself in the laundromat, oh. but but Maybe yeah, be- there were times when it wasn't working. But I was thinking about laundry rooms and apartment buildings mm-hmm. in general. Oh, yeah. Why are they always so creepy? They're so creepy. Ours at the <laughs> Saltaire apartment? Well, that was a creepy. It was a little tiny room went off of the alley. Yeah. Yeah. And like oftentimes there would be like a homeless person just hanging yeah. out outside of it. That's like mm-hmm. a very whatever like city thing. Mm-hmm. And then the one, uh, the laundry uh, the laundry room in my apartment before that was also like very small, strange, creepy under the stairs. Like it was awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hated it. I hated doing laundry when I lived in an apartment. Yeah, yeah. Not that I love it now, but at least it's like in your own home. Yeah. But I just can't imagine like, okay, already in a space that is not really your space, right? It's a shared space. Sure. It They're never in a good spot in an apartment building or laundromat. And just, I always felt like, ugh, in mm-hmm. every... Funny. Like shared space like that, a uh, laundry space. Yeah. If the doors started opening and closing, if the coin machine freaked out. Oh, yeah. Thought, what the? Ugh. <laughs> this was so, so creepy. Mm-hmm. That quarter. Yeah. <sighs> aye, aye, aye. Uh, I got a few pictures. Uh, this first one photo of the inside of this laundromat. Apparently, the photo taken by the victim of this alleged encounter when they returned later with their boyfriend. So, this is the one. Apparently. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it looks like any laundromat I've ever been in. Uh Uh-huh, very similar, yeah. I kind of like the red folding tables, actually. Uh, Second, The second photo just shows how long and narrow it really looks. Okay, okay. The little infinite hallway. And then just one more where you can see that claw machine and ATM in the background. Uh, I guess uh, they didn't want to get any closer. I guess, you know, I zoomed in on my computer, but it's way in the background on the right. Uh, Yeah. Uh Uh-huh, is uh, is those, those little machines. Yeah. You're really good at the claw machine, the claw game. Yeah, I have moments. I've had some, had some good ones. Well, it's always been with me. So I, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you are a, uh, a claw, claw master. master. I, I, I spent a lot uh, one time in Riggins um, at the Sam River Inn. They had that claw machine for a while. Yeah. And I got like, I got Kyler one. And I want to say I got Kyler one on the first try. Yes, I think I have a recollection of uh-huh, this, and then was, wasted a lot of money trying to yep, get one for Momo. Yep, and then I and then I felt compelled because she because he had got one. I didn't even think she wanted one. I don't know. Oh, uh, they they don't want it until the other one has yep, it. Until the other one gets it, and then she wanted one, and I'm like, well, I have to get her one now. And then I must have burned through twenty bucks just like over did and you over. Get it? I did. Okay, I stayed until I I got it. Well, here here's a little local tip. Okay, uh, if you go to Triple Play, the claw machine that has these like spiky little bouncy balls in them. Uh, it'll just let you keep going until you win. Yeah, those little balls are so cheap. I mean, they, they probably cost, they, they must be like two cents each. They're yeah. very thin like plastic, but they are pretty fun that we we would uh, go there. Yeah, you get one for every like, uh, I don't know, 50 cents or whatever you Yeah, whatever takes. you put in, but like you just get to keep going until yep. you win. So yep. 50 cents, you could be playing for an hour. <laughs> uh-huh, yep. You just keep going and going until you grab one. And then we would play, we called it like wall ball uh-huh. uh, in the driveway at home with those little things. Oh, God, made, you- made up our whole little game. Yep, you busted your knee. I know. Yeah, I messed my knee up playing that game. Yep, yep. But yeah, that's a that was a great story. Oh, thanks. I really like. I too. really like that. Uh, who sent that one in? Uh, Molly. Molly. Good mm-hmm. job, Molly Jean Box. <laughs> um. All right. Well, are you ready to get settled in and go camping? Uh, yeah. Kind of. Mm-hmm. Kind of camping. Do you have a Layla over there? I do. Who, who uh, you got this week? I, I, I have... saw you do a swap. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just went down to one. Oh, okay. I just, need, I just need one Layla. I took one out. I saw I saw the furry guy get removed. Yeah, he's back in the bin for now. Oh. He's fine. He's got a lot of friends in there. He does? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. They're hanging out? Oh, totally. They're having a great time. <laughs> I think we talked about that early on, like uh, assigning human traits to inanimate uh-huh, objects. Uh-huh. Such a funny thing. All right, well, here we go. Hello, Dan and Lindsay. Hello. I've got a bone-chilling encounter story to share that's usually kept under wraps. Most people tend not to believe it, which is why I've been selective about sharing. But after what happened, I became a firm believer in the paranormal. 
More than a few years ago, during a high school camping trip with my best friends, something inexplicable and terrifying occurred. It completely shifted my perspective and convinced me that ghosts and entities are very real. In our teenage years, my two closest companions and I were consumed by an insatiable hunger for weekend camping excursions. We saw them as a liberating escape from the clutches of our parents, school pressures, and the complexities of our adolescent relationships. The prospect of kicking back, letting loose, and indulging in cold beers and, in one friend's case, Smirnoff Ice, was (laughs) something we savored. Usually, we'd gravitate to the convenience of established campgrounds. However, on this particular occasion, we decided to venture deep into the wilderness to camp beside a stream that wound its way through a dense, sinister forest about an hour's drive from town. We were somewhat familiar with the location, thanks to my friend's older brother, who had brought us there for fishing trips. We'd spent countless days fishing along the stream, but never had we dared to stay the night. As the school bell released us from its grasp on that ominous Friday afternoon, we converged on my truck, preloaded with all the essentials for our journey, which inevitably included a stash of beer and Smirnoff ice. (laughs) We squeezed into my cramped cab, our voices filled with excitement, as we discussed the thrilling fishing and frivolity, frivolity that awaited us. Little did we know that this weekend would be irrevocably shatter our love for the woods. As we rumbled down the desolate dirt road that led us to the forest's edge, a peculiar wave of anxiety washed over me, a chilling tension that I attempted to dismiss. I couldn't comprehend why this road, familiar to me in every way, now felt so alien. Our chosen campsite lay at the very end of the road where the ominous stream wound its way. With our camping backpack slung over our shoulders, we embarked on our journey into the forest following the twisted path of the stream. The spot we had chosen to set up camp was roughly a mile upstream, a sandy clearing in the dense woods where the earth was strangely soft and devoid of grass, seemed the perfect site for our campfire. The hike to our chosen destination was fraught with obstacles. The heavy cooler packed with our weekend sustenance was weighing us down. We often paused to catch our breath and perhaps even indulge in some fishing along the way. Hours passed before we reached our destination, and the sun's last rays bathed our campsite in an eerie, fading light. Hasty preparations were made as we set up camp, starting a modest fire. With sizzling hot dogs and a few swigs of beer, we began discussing our plans for the following day. As the flickering firelight dimmed, we decided it was time to retreat. We kicked off our shoes to avoid tracking dirt and mud into the tent, and tired from our arduous trek, we surrendered to sleep. The following morning, I was jolted awake by my friends who appeared agitated. I emerged from the tent only to discover that our shoes had mysteriously disappeared. Assuming it was a prank, I demanded that my friends return my shoes. I scanned the campsite, but they were nowhere in sight. My confusion mounted as I turned to my friends for answers. Wordlessly, they pointed upwards towards the branches of a tree directly over our campsite. I gazed upward, puzzled, until I spotted them. Our shoes were tied to a branch above the tent. Initially, I suspected a joke orchestrated by my friends, but the realization hit me like a thunderbolt. There was no way they could have reached that branch. To retrieve our shoes, we had to disassemble the tent, and even with my tallest friend's precarious perch on the cooler, reaching them was a near-impossible feat. As this revelation settled in, an unsettling wave of anxiety engulfed me. I tried to shrug it off, reluctant to let this peculiar incident taint our camping experience. As the day unfolded, we brushed aside the eerie morning occurrence, immersing ourselves in fishing and animated discussions about school crushes. Mm -hmm. Oddly, we had no success in catching fish for hours, a confounding anomaly at a stream we knew so well. Fueled by our determination, we ventured deeper into the woods, working our way upstream until we finally found a spot where the fish were biting. Our spirits buoyed by our newfound success, we whiled away the hours, the sun gradually descending. We decided it was time to return to our campsite. The journey back took much longer than expected, and by the time we arrived, darkness had cloaked the forest. We found ourselves caught in the eerie twilight where darkness was punctuated only by faint, ghostly remnants of twilight. A chilling realization dawned on us. Our campsite was not as we had left it. The temperature had dropped dramatically, an unnatural chill invading the sultry Florida night, a stark departure from the warmth we'd anticipated. Even more unsettling, everything in our campsite had shifted. 
yet nothing was torn apart or scattered as if an animal had rummaged through our belongings. It was as though some otherworldly force had rearranged our campsite with no discernible pattern or purpose. For instance, the cooler that had served as our backrest was now positioned in the center of the clearing. The tent, firmly staked down, had moved nearly five feet from its original spot. An uncanny sense of unease pervaded the camp. To add to our discomfort, an unexpected storm approach it, approached suddenly pouring down on our rain suddenly pouring rain down on our campsite. We scrambled to rescue our belongings and huddled inside our small tent to escape the relentless downpour. This time, we brought our shoes inside to prevent any eerie reenactment of the morning's strange occurrences. Cold and soaked, we clung to our flashlights, seeking comfort in their feeble glow. Although we attempted to make ourselves as comfortable as possible, a profound disquiet continued to hang over us. Eventually, sleep overcame us amidst the steady drumming of raindrop on the tense fabric and rustling leaves outside. Once more, I was rudely awakened by one of my friends who whispered frantically, There's someone out there, man. Oh God, there's someone out there. Still groggy, I attempted to dismiss it as more of a product of his imagination. Yet it wasn't too long before I too heard it, a cacophony of frenetic splashing emanating in the direction of the stream. We all fell silent, our breaths shallow as the disconcerting sounds grew louder, akin to the playful splashes one might hear at a swimming pool. However eerie the absence of any other sounds except the splashing rendered the experience deeply unsettling. We nudged our sleeping friend, asking if he too heard it, but the noise had inexplicably ceased. He suggested it was likely an animal and encouraged us to return to sleep. And just as he uttered these words, his eyes widened in sudden terror. An unnatural coldness seeped into the tent. A haunting revelation seized us all. We heard the distinct, disquieting sound of footsteps, unmistakably human, walking on soft, wet sand toward our tent. As the presence drew nearer, it was accompanied by the eerie sound of long, skeletal nails scraping along the nylon tarp outside our tent. We froze in terror, our eyes locked in silent communication. We dared not breathe, desperately hoping that our silence might protect us, that this unseen entity might retreat. Please go away, please just go away, I silently begged, but it did not. The eerie rhythmic sound, initially originating near the stream, now encircled our tent. It was as if an invisible malevolence paced around us, scraping its ghostly fingers along the tent's fabric, searching for an entry point. An oppressive si an oppressive silence engulfed us as it neared the tent's entrance. The only sound, the soft hiss of nails on nylon. The fear was palpable, suffocating us like a stifling humidity, and my friends and I dared not move. As we watched in horror, the tent's zipper slowly began to move, as though some unseen force was probing for a way inside. My desire to scream was overwhelming, but it felt as though the air in my lungs had congealed into stone when suddenly one of my friends lunged forward, gripped the zipper, and shouted, Please go away! Just please go away! A spell seemed to shatter, releasing the tension that had gripped us. The air returned to my lungs, and all three of us joined in in screaming for the malevolent entity to leave. We continued screaming even after the entity had vanished. Our voices grew hoarse, and once more, our silence descended upon our campsite. And just like that, it was over or so we thought. Understandably, none of us managed to sleep for the remainder of the night. I don't think I even blinked once. We waited for the sun to rise sufficiently before daring to exit the tent, and when we finally unzipped the flap, we were met with a horrifying sight. There were prints in the damp sand, footprints that appeared to materialize from the stream and encircle our tent before completely vanishing as if the entity responsible had simply evaporated. In haste, we packed up our belongings and fled from the woods, making the journey in half the time it had taken us to reach the campsite. To the best of my knowledge, none of us have returned to that cursed location in the years that have elapsed since that nightmarish evening. The pit in my stomach tells me that had that enigmatic presence breached our tent, none of us would have escaped those woods alive. What a strange one. What a strange tale. Some watery water beast coming out of the stream. The creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the weirdest parts of that story for me, oh, and great narration, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, good time. Um, was... The Smirnoff Ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I did have a note about Smirnoff Ice. I was going to talk about that in a second. But was the um, the tent moving? Like, okay, like when you come back and like... Um, oh, the tent having been moved? Right. Like yeah. Rearranging like coolers and stuff. Because I could see like, okay, somebody coming by and kind of like going through their stuff. And yeah. And not wanting them to know they had gone through their stuff. 
and maybe like, you know, accidentally placing things a little bit differently than where they initially kind of started to rummage through them. Right. But a tent, you have to drive up the stakes. That's a, that's a whole ordeal. Yes. To move a tent six inches. Mm-hmm. You have to do a lot of work. Um, but to move it like several feet, that was so weird. I agree. Because like nobody... I mean, that'd have to be like a really dedicated practical joke, like a friend of theirs. Oh, man. If the other stuff in the story hadn't happened later. Yeah. They just wanted to like throw the stuff up in the branch, Mm -hmm. you know, like um, come by, move all their stuff significantly when they're fishing just to like mess with their minds. Uh Uh-huh. But then with the, you know, the creature that they, or the, that night, Mm -hmm. that adds obviously, you know, paranormal element to it. But that's just so weird. Like why, why would it do that? That would be such a fun practical joke. Oh yeah. Rearrange someone's campsite. Okay, you guys. Tyler no longer works here. <laughs> and he loves to spend time in the woods. And he I also think, has he also has a gun on him at all times. Okay, but I think it could be <laughs> I think it could be really fun. Yeah. To find out from his wife. Okay. Where he's going camping. Oh my God. And then wait till he's like out fishing and just go and just like for an entire weekend, just move things just like a few inches here, a few inches there. Like, like if his cooler was you know, flap like the the opening on this side, just like turn it around. Just all those little things that would start to weigh on you. But if he comes back when you're doing that, he might shoot us. There is a good chance he'll shoot you. I was gonna say, knowing Tyler, he would see it and then he would just clock it in his head and go about his business as normal and wait for someone to come back again. Yeah, like he'd be up in a tree stand like with a, with a sniper rifle. <laughs> <laughs> just like, here's my chance. He's like, damn it, Cummins. <laughs> ah, but that would be such a great joke. Yeah. Like if you're camping with friends over a weekend and mm-hmm. everybody's kind of got their own little you know, space, but you're all sharing a bigger campsite. Yeah. Just, oh God, just pick one person. Just keep moving their stuff around a little just, bit. Just a little bit. Just just hardly noticeable, but enough that they're like, huh. I told you I did that to Eddie years ago, right? I, I know I've talked about it in one of these shows. My When, when Eddie and I lived together, Eddie Mraz. Yeah. Um, oh, I love Eddie. He's uh, one of my favorite people. <laughs> when we were, I mean, we were like 19, 20 this time, but I don't remember how many times I did it, but I would just like go over it when he was not in our room. I would just go over to his side of the room and just slightly rearrange all of his stuff. Oh my so God. So like, like put his little, like if he had like on his desk, take the picture on the right side of the monitor, put it on the left side, you know, just slightly adjust his keyboard a little differently. Yeah. Just, you know, take some pens out of one container, put them in another container, just little things. Yeah. But over and over and over. He never said anything, but when I asked him about it years later, he was like, I thought something weird was going on, <laughs> but I should, I should have kept doing it. Yeah. Oh, I was waiting for him to flip out on you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because he, Eddie he is a- at that time. Uh, he's still fiery. He can, he can still be fiery, but he was—he was. He's a take no shit more kind of guy back then. Yeah. I can't—I can only imagine. Uh, what was your note about Smirnoff Ice? Oh yeah, <laughs> um, did you ever drink Smirnoff Ice? I did not. I was a Zima girl. I also I wrote Zima. I this is um, so embarrassing, but it's true. But I didn't party really in high school, so I didn't like. Drink Why is that beer. embarrassing? Uh, no, no. The, what's coming next? Oh. Um, so I didn't develop a taste for beer or anything. And then, you know, we get to college, everybody wants to like, you know, drink beer and stuff. And yeah, I would get there too. It's cheap and it's fun to get a buzz and everything. Me and my buddy, Paul Runnels, uh-huh. um, <laughs> we would like, we were so embarrassed. We would like, okay, don't tell anybody about this. We would just like shut our dorm room. We'd come to my dorm room That's so cute, and we would pound Zima's. Because we couldn't handle drinking beer. I love this. We'd have to drink enough Zima to be able to then go out later. And drink beer. And and not look squeamish. Just having like a regular beer. I'm going to need you after this to text Paul and just like, (laughs) just text him Zima. Ah, remember the Zima days. Remember when? (laughs) Yeah. Did you guys drop Jolly Ranchers in your Zimas to adjust the flavor? No, I didn't know about that at the time. Oh. We, we, We didn't like have any like real, we just knew that Zima... I think somebody told us, maybe we saw like one of our friends. We were, it was like the two of us were friends with a lot of girls. That adds up. And, um, and I think some of them drank Zima. Yeah, of course. Uh huh. And that's where we, like, we didn't want to drink beer either. Yeah. We got a taste. It was like for so it. bloating. Even if you mm. like the beer, you're just like, mm, oh, you yeah. Know? And you're yeah. Like, trying to like show off how cute you are. You don't <laughs> want to be all bloated with beer. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. All right. Well, do you have time for one more story, Dave? I do. Okay. Great. This that was is. A great one. Yeah, this is uh, just a reminder. This story is a little bit about can encountering spirits in one location make you more susceptible to them in another location? Ooh, like once you've opened that door. Possibly. Hi, Dan and Lindsay. Hello. After hearing your fears of shadow figures and the seemingly, seemingly prevalent idea that all shadow figures are bad shadow figures, I wanted to reach out to you with a story of my own. In my experience, it's only the figures with eyes that have malevolent energy. The others seem to just be curious. I used to live in a second-story apartment outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. This apartment was definitely haunted. There were three shadow figures who routinely appeared in that apartment, but they were curiously not the scariest thing there. 
They all had routines. One would come up the stairs every night and fizzle out as it made it to the top step. Another would appear once, twice a week in the laundry room and just stare intensely, or at least that was the energy it gave off as it had no features, so it's hard to say for sure, at the washing machine as if trying to figure out what the hell a washing machine was. And the third was more interactive. It would stand over my shoulder when I was on the computer in the main living area of the apartment. If I didn't acknowledge it quickly enough or if I tried to ignore it, it would step to the side into my peripheral vision where it would block out the light until I told it, yes, yes, I see you. Now please go away. I'm trying to work. I never had any sort of bad feelings from any of these shadow figures. Some spooks, yes, but not any sense that they were harmful. Now, during that same time period, my friends and I would frequently go out at night looking for scares. Graveyards, abandoned buildings, even abandoned tunnels, nothing was off limits for us. We had one cemetery in particular that always gave us good results. It was fairly large, and the road that wound through it would split Uh, It was fairly large, and the road that wound through it split into two towards the back. One section went forward to a very old part of the cemetery, while the other part intersected it perpendicularly before curving off to the side to connect with the main road. Between these two roads was a small, dense area of trees, and at the top of the T where the roads met, there was a small shed, presumably used by the caretakers. We had seen shadow figures in this cluster of trees more than once, peeking out from behind the trees or seeming to dance in between them, though they never scared us. The last time we visited, though, we did get scared. There were five of us, myself and my friends, Aaron, Britt, Claire, and Dylan. We split up on this trip, which may have been the problem. Aaron, Britt, and I went to the curved road around the trees, approaching the shed, hoping to see the shadows in the trees once again. Claire and Dylan had gone off in the other direction, taking their time, wandering around the place. As we came towards the T of the road, my group was surprised to see Claire and Dylan coming towards us on the intersecting road, heading towards the older part of the cemetery and the shed. We called out to them, but they didn't acknowledge us, even though they were no more than, say, 30 feet away. They continued walking forwards for a few seconds longer and then froze. We were close enough to see the fear on their faces. They turned and ran back the way that we came. My group couldn't see anything abnormal, so needless to say, we were only freaked out by their reactions. We tried to call both Claire and Dylan's cell phones, but our calls weren't going through. The area had never been a dead spot before, but suddenly our phones just weren't working. After about 10 minutes of this, my phone started ringing and Claire's number showed on my display. I answered and began to ask what the hell had happened, but she cut me off. Get the fuck to the car right now or we're leaving without you, she yelled, and she sounded legitimately terrified. She refused to say anything, but none of us were eager to be abandoned in a cemetery, so we booked it towards the car. We didn't even have the doors closed before Claire started speeding out of the cemetery. Neither she nor Dylan spoke until we were off the road the cemetery sat on. Dylan was the one who told us about what had happened. There was a person in the intersection, he said. We thought it was Aaron at first, but it was really dark. And as we were watching it, it dropped on all floors, all fours, and started crawling towards us. I swear, I still thought it was Aaron for a second, but then its eyes, they were red, and it moved so fucking fast, nobody can move that fast. Aaron, Britt, and I were shocked, to say the least. Well, we didn't see anything, we told them. You weren't there. You couldn't have seen anything, Claire said defensively. Well, we saw you, I replied. We were on the other path. We saw you guys run. You were not, Claire said, clearly growing more frustrated. We didn't see anyone else. You weren't there. You could not have been there. But we saw your faces, Aaron told her. And the conversation ended there because none of us could quite understand what had just happened. I don't have a definite explanation for that night, but the best I can figure is that we were in some sort of time slip where my group saw the other two in a moment of terror while being somehow separate from it, like watching it play out on TV. And I have to wonder if the time slip had anything to do with the spirits in my apartment. Were they connected in some way? We never did go back to that particular cemetery. I mean, what if next time we got stuck in whatever other timeline we had managed to slip into? Interesting. I know. Time slips are really starting to freak me out. Uh huh. We have, did we talk about that on the bonus episode? Yep, we did. Yeah, yeah. yeah we just talked about that when we recorded the last one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so random, but when you first brought up good shadow figures, like, uh-huh. or, like or when the um, the person leaving the story did, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's just weird how the brain works. Uh huh. My mind immediately flashed on this little cartoon, this little frog from this, no! from this old Warner Brothers cartoon 
where they find him inside uh, this like old cinder block or something. But it's he, he dances. He has a top hat. And I was just picturing. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yep. And I was picturing his shadow. Like he's the little good shadow person. Like the little shadow of the guy going, hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. Hello, my ragtime gal. Like he did his little dance. I'm pretty sure that- for me that was like the, <laughs> at the very beginning before. I want to say it was like Little Giants maybe. But yeah, yeah it's absolutely. I, I remember. Uh, it's like old Looney Tunes. It's not even Looney Tunes. It's like yeah. Warner Brothers. It's like an old cartoon from like the 40s or mm-hmm, something. Mm-hmm. I, I just that's I, where I remember it from though. But it, I don't know if they put like started reusing it or whatever. Oh. But I remember it so vividly from my childhood of being. Yeah, I almost if I would watch it again, I'd probably know every frame of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was in maybe it wasn't a center, but he was in like a safe. I think he was maybe on an like, lunchbox a bench or something like. Yeah, it was something like that. But yeah, then yeah. he puts on a top hat and then uh-huh. starts doing the dance. Yeah, because they found him. He'd been trapped in this place. And the one cartoon I watched, he'd been trapped in there for like god decades, or whatever. And I, and I remember them like getting tired of him singing. And they would shut yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they would open it again. Hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. Hello, my rag. <laughs> like he just like singing sure. his little frog ass off. I don't even know what you're. T- For a second, I <laughs> thought you were talking about Mr. Toad and Mr. Frog or like that. Like oh. it's like a, a, a no, basically one. like a learn to read book. Oh, not a. You never saw. I got to show you the YouTube video after the show. It's such a classic cartoon. I, oddly, I feel like I can picture it, but huh? I can't connect it to anything. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm like that would be a fun little shadow to have. Well, maybe annoying if you didn't shut up, but like for a nice little shadow person, just a little shadow frog guy, a little dancer. I had a shadow person scare this morning. You did. I did. Uh, you got up before me because you're waking up at ungodly hours, and I apparently need ten hours of sleep right now for my body to uh-huh. repair itself. And our bedroom door was like cracked open, yeah. and so I woke up. And if you are lying on my side of the bed, I mean, you could do it from your side too, but just because mine is closer to the door. If I look in the mirror and the door is open, I can see you out into the hallway. Yeah. You had just come down the stairs Mm -hmm. and you were standing in that little space, like at the bottom of the steps, but before you go into our bathroom. Oh, yeah. So just this outline of this very tall person. I knew it was you. I heard you, but I could see in the mirror. And then you just stood there and you must have been doing something on your phone, listening Mm. or watching or pulling up a podcast. What time was that? Uh, 6.45. I was out of the house by six. You were not. Yeah, I was. No, you weren't. I, I, can, I didn't yeah, sell no. it. Yeah, no. I didn't sell it. I was No, because I, ah, damn it. I, no, I already knew your schedule this morning, <laughs> so I knew that you were home. Uh, um, but it was so creepy for just, I had to like convince myself like, Lindsay, that is just Dan. He is going, yeah. he's looking at his phone. He's going to look up in a second. You're going to see his face in the mirror. He's going to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. But for about what felt like five minutes, but was probably about five seconds, I was like, holy shit. Oh my God. <laughs> and then- in fact, you flicked on the light and I saw you and I saw the, the shape of your body and I was, was like, me. oh, thank you, Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Like, do you think that it's possible that like the spirits in her apartment were connected to the cemetery? Is it? It's I don't like, know. if you're, I do kind of believe that, well, in this instance, I believe that like, well, if this person is open to acknowledging and interacting with the spirits in their apartment, yeah. then they're just open to entities in general like that's, that's so what i was thinking it's like it's like not it's connected but your willingness yeah, yeah yeah your willingness is the connective tissue for me because i have wondered that i wondered if i if i if i ever do all of a sudden have a much more intense paranormal experience than the one i maybe had you know years ago like yeah. if i actually saw some figure yeah something like that where i'm like oh my god or you know like a person that just looks like a person walks into the room and then they just disappear Ugh. i'm like would that be the beginning of just the rest of my life seeing those kind of things possibly yeah because you know? just now you're open to it and now, and now, yeah, you're kind of looking for it in a different way. Sort of like trying a new food. You know, you try this new thing, you really like it. And mm-hmm. so now every time it's on a menu, you get it because it looks good. And you know what it is now and you enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I started to say that, I was like, this is not going to make any sense, but I am freaking <laughs> starving. Uh, <sighs> do you want to uh, sh- uh, thank some Annabelles or do you want I me to do. first? I do. I can start. Okay. I'd like to thank the following Annabelles. We will announce our uh, March charity in a couple weeks. Yeah. Until then, thanks for supporting us. Teresa Lee or Lay, Kurt Hallett, Morgan Black, Sucker Tomei, T-I-M-M-E-H. Tomei? How do you spell it again? T-I-M-M-E-H. T-I-M-M-E-H. Yeah, sucker uh, Tomei. Tomei? Yeah. But like, I'm thinking it's like a Timmy, time sucker. Tomei? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Christian Bailey, Craig, Captain Levi Whiskerhorn. <laughs> Captain Whiskerhorn, hilarious. <laughs> Lex Infinity, Sharice Romero, and Corey Strader. Awesome. Uh, thank you. And I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for also supporting what we do here. Uh, Whippoorwill, 
uh, Tootsie Pop, Tomato, Puppy Dog, Ding Dong, Tootsie. Uh, I'm just making up words. Uh, <laughs> you almost got me. I know. Uh, I like to think Sarah Ownhead. Sarah, uh, no. Owen yeah. Head. You didn't put an E. You just wrote o- O-W-N. You put O-W-N oh, dash head. Sarah that's, Ownhead. That's pretty funny because Sarah and I emailed because she got <laughs> missed and she we were like just dying about like the... Um, that that is she's like that is this oh, is truly so it's Owen Head Owen Head she and hyphenated she's like this is actually my name you can't even imagine like oh, the things that I have that heard. makes more sense than Own Head because I was like okay it's Sarah's she got her own head Own Head <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just copy and pasted so I must have entered it wrong in the first place well Sarah <laughs> all those emails Sarah, are really paying off you got extra attention though now uh, Ian Young Anna Welch Vasquez Tyler Calic uh, Jared Williams Katie Hall Sharon Corcoran Darcy Hauser, Sarah Mark, Darcy Hauser. Oh, I'm thinking of Doogie Hauser. I'm like, why is that name familiar? Uh, Sarah Mark, and then Lucifina Spoopy Sis. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's cute. All right, and then I have the following uh, Spoopy shoutouts yeah. to to Ava, aka Stinky from Mommy and Daddy. Happy birthday! We hope your day is unique as you are, and we hope you have a good time skating with your friends. To uh, Mom Kim from your daughter Stephanie, uh, your spooky daughter. Happy birthday to the most amazing mom in the world. I love you. To Ray from Luca. It feels like we've been together a millennia or two. Aww. Happy second anniversary and happy birthday. Looking forward to many more years together. Love you lots. To Nadia from Christy. Happy 21st birthday. To Sabrina from Dustin. Happy third wedding anniversary. And to Brianna from Brianna. Happy birthday. Uh, Brianna uh, her and her daughter lost her husband, dad, uh, uh, just this January, very young man. And so we just want to tell you that we are also sending you guys a lot of light and love in this very challenging time. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. And that is it. And that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to You can email us still for everything else at info at scared to death podcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith for recording, scoring today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander, organizing the My Story emails. To book editor Drew Atana, polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thank you to Sophie Evans for finding the first story told this week. And to Molly Jean Box for finding the second. We're on YouTube if you want to watch the show. We're on Facebook and Instagram where we post pics that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. We have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers Enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. Hello, my darling. Hello, my baby. Hello, my ragtime gal. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare the death. And Magic Productions. Thank you for visiting. Thank you for visiting. Thank you for visiting. Thank you for visiting.